Ireland MP, uh, who's our local MP, has agreed to come along and talk to us about localism. You may have heard about localism, it's the new government initiative to focus on communities, what communities want, uh, want in their local areas. And Robert's trying to give us an idea of what that means from a central government perspective. Robert. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here and to be here amongst so many people who have become friends, who I know, and some new faces who I hope to meet later on. Um, I may have to dash away it, it after my presentation, after the Q&A, because I've got a few, a few other responsibilities to attend to, such as the uh, life of a Member of Parliament, but you would expect that because quite what you expect from a Member of, of Parliament, a degree of commitment to the area, to the place in which I live, and a degree of commitment to the residents to make sure that the voice of residents is being heard at all levels of government, not just central government, but local government as well. Now, I believe that the best means by which we can strengthen our society is to push power as far as possible to the lowest possible level. I think that the days of centralisation of control from the top are numbered. I think they're numbered because it's a very inefficient way to run a society. And if governments continue to centralise and to control, I think it leads to fractures within our society. I think it leads to, to a dislocation between the governed and those who govern us. And that is not healthy. The planning process, I think, is one of those areas where the public are most engaged with government. Uh, issues will suddenly come out of nowhere that cause concern, sometimes anger, uh, uh, and uh, uh, that can often lead to a, a really negative perception, I think, of government processes, and can lead to a problem in the democratic process itself. And I think it's irresponsible of anybody in elected office not to ignore that fundamental fact. We have, as uh, elected politicians, a constant duty to remind ourselves uh, and to ask ourselves the questions about whether or not the processes that we have in place are working. And if they're not working, then things need to be done to change them. And we need to be asking that question every day of the year, with or without the planning issues that come up uh, and rise up and, and cause concern and anxiety in the community. And that's why I believe that the Localism Act that was passed in November of last year will really help see a change of culture when it comes to the way in which we develop uh, our local communities and the way in which we plan for the future. I don't think it's good enough anymore uh, to see uh, engagement only when planning applications come forward. I don't think it's good enough for the community. I don't think it's good enough for the politicians. I think it's a, it's a far better approach would be the one that is uh, envisaged by the Localism Act, which is that instead of reacting to events, everybody is involved in preparing for them, in planning for them, in having a say in the future. And what I wanted to talk to you about today was some hard and fast concrete proposals that will be coming in later this spring. And they relate to neighbourhood plans. Now, neighbourhood plans it sounds an extremely dull subject, but it's not. I think it's one of the most important areas in which members of the community can become engaged in the process. Because for the first time, local people have a major statutory say in helping to shape development. Because these plans won't just be of persuasive authority, they will have equal status to the development plan that will exist, in Swindon's case, for the whole borough. The plans that will be developed locally in neighbourhoods will determine what uh, development should occur and what it should look like. What sort of environment do we want? What sort of community do we want to live in? And they're going to be approved by the people. There will be referendums held in every neighbourhood to approve those plans, where a majority, which will be an absolute majority of 51% of everyone who votes, will say yay or nay to the plan <coughs> as proposed. Let me just take you through, first of all, the way in which, the stages in which the plans will develop. And then I'll try and answer some of the obvious questions that perhaps you may be thinking uh, about uh, what I'm saying. First of all, it will be the job of the local authority and indeed the interested uh, group to define the neighbourhood that we're talking about. So we can avoid boundary overlaps and confusion and any lack of clarity in the areas that we're talking about. 
Then the second stage will be the preparation of the plan, plans themselves. Then the third stage will be an independent check by an, uh, by an examiner. That could be somebody from another planning authority, an approved expert, but somebody who not, <coughs> is not just appointed by the council, but who is here by the agreement of the local group or forum. And then the community referendum stage, which I've just talked about, and then, of course, that all-important uh, stage, once the referendum is completed, and if there's a yes vote, that document will then have legal force, which means that the decision-makers in the town halls will be obliged to take fully into account the neighbourhood plan when determining applications in the future. So, <clears throat> to come back then to the beginning, um, neighbourhood planning, is it available everywhere? Yes, it is. <coughs> Parish councils will be the obvious vehicle in our villages uh, and in our small towns. But in areas like Old Town, areas like Eskid, there will be neighbourhood planning available. And it will be available via the mechanism of a neighbourhood forum. Well, what's that you're asking? Well, it could be a new group that could be formed by interested residents, or it could be an existing group of residents who want to go ahead and help develop the plan. Now they must have, any group that proposes itself as a neighbourhood forum, must have the express purpose of wanting to promote or improve the social, economic or environmental well-being of their local area. It all sounds rather than an apple party, but actually it's very important that groups are formed with that express purpose in mind, so that the whole community can feel a part of it. <coughs> the forums would have to be open to those living and working in the local area, and uh, they must have a written constitution, and at least 21 members in order to qualify <coughs> for the purposes of being a neighbourhood forum. Then an application can be made to the local authority and granted, or if, if there are more than one applications, then there needs to be consideration about which would take precedence. I, there are regulations that are being developed which set out time scales. They're not being finalised yet, and that may be one of the questions that we need to come back to. And I, as I've said to Colin before the meeting, if there are any specific issues about <coughs> those groups, then I'd be more than happy to get those questions answered and to provide them to the Residents Association and indeed to any organisation that wishes to take this forward. So, secondly then, what help will the uh, local forums get? Well, the local authority, that is Swindon Borough Council in our area, has a legal duty to support and, and advise neighbourhood forums. Now that word advise is important. They're not there to tell you what to do, they're there to help you through the process. So the sort of things that the council can do is share the evidence that they have about the basis of their planning development, uh, to help with any consultation events that should take place as part of the development of the plan, and to provide evidence, as I said, about any assessments that they may have carried out, and also to provide advice and support on local and national planning guidance policies. Because the neighbourhood plan does have to work in a framework that is consistent with national and local development. So, in other words, it's not going to be carte blanche for people to just go off on a tangent. It will have to work within a cohesive framework. But what the neighbourhood plan is able to do, I believe, is to really go into the details that are so often important to the lives of many of us. You know, um, what we think about, uh, for example, bedroom conversions, or housing extensions, or tree planting, or allocation of houses for old people, will be of very great importance to neighbourhoods. And frankly, I think often those details are overlooked when it comes to bigger area plans. It's that sort of detail that I believe local plans will be able to help deal with. Well, what will be the costs of all this? Well, there's, no, there's not going to be a fixed template about the plans. You won't have to follow a tick box. And you won't, they can be as short or as long as residents approve. Obviously, the bigger the plan becomes, the more evidence that is needed, and, and that will, of course, take more time and will involve costs. But the government will be providing up to £50 million pounds over the next three years to help local councils with that process. And indeed, four separate support groups, independent groups, 
to advise local forums are also being set up by the government so that uh, local forums can go to outside bodies to get advice and help. So the first task, uh, I think, that, that, that is important to, to, to identify will be to work out who is going to support the creation of the plan and uh, how the existing planning evidence is going to be looked at. So in other words, you're not going to be just left on your own floating. <coughs> there will be sources of the advice and support. And indeed, there will be other examples of other neighbourhoods that may have gone further down the road that you want to look at. I mean, locally, South Marston is the one area that is ahead of the game. They were given um, some funding to go to be a pathfinder, if you like, and they are already developing their neighbourhood plan. Uh, and I think talking to that parish council could be quite instructive about the way in which they've gone about it. Now, uh, I've mentioned the funding issue about the 50 million that the government is uh, uh, making available for this process. <coughs> and I've also said that the neighbourhood plan has to conform to the uh, local plan. Now, what I mean by that is that there has to be a general conformity, conformity to the strategic elements of the local plan, but that, the, the council's plan, but that, as I said, that doesn't mean that then, locally in neighbourhoods, we can't start looking at the detail and deciding things that are important to us, that may not be strategically important to the borough, but which are of vital importance to us in our local neighbourhood. Now, um, uh, where are up to, this is an important issue I think some of you may be asking. At the moment, Swindon's uh, Borough Council's local plan is still developing. It's not yet finally in place. But that doesn't stop local neighbourhoods from actually going ahead and working up their neighbourhood plans. If anything, I think it's a great opportunity for collaborative working between the council and neighbourhood boards to develop a cohesive set of plans that will stand the test of time stand up to uh, anybody who seeks to challenge them. I've mentioned the next process. Let's say we've developed a plan, we like what we've seen, we've gone out to residents, we've talked to them, we've perhaps done some doorstep surveys, we've collected information, uh, we've got a list of priorities, we've developed, I think, the, you know, the bones of the plan. What happens then? Well, the plan has to be examined to make sure that it is in accordance with the law. It's not going to be like some formal planning inspector's inquiry. Planning inspectors could do the examination, but it's going to be a much more informal process, which is there really to check the plan for compatibility rather than to start undermining and undoing all the work that's been done by the local community. It's going to be a light touch, but it is important because obviously plans do have to conform with the legal framework. Um, and then I've mentioned the referendum mechanism. I think I've explained that it's uh, going to be an absolute majority, 51% of those who vote. Now, um, it's, I, I, I apologise, ladies and gentlemen, for sounding a little bit nuts and boats about it. But frankly, if localism is going to mean anything, then we have to start talking about the way in which we're going to develop neighbourhood plans. Because without them, we are not going to be able to build the new structures that I think we need to see when it comes to planning. And I come back before sitting down and taking questions and answers to the point that I made at the beginning, that it's time for a sea change in the way in which we do planning in this country. It's time for local residents to have a proactive role at the beginning of the process, rather than to have to face challenge and surprise when applications come from out of the room. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. That was really interesting. Um, can I ask, are there any questions from the audience? Toby, if you could... Uh, the lady in the scarf, perhaps? Can check the level on the... Roving mic, if that's better. <coughs> the lady in the scarf. Sorry, <coughs> Thank you. Do you want to hold the mic? Do you want it about two inches away from your mouth? Yeah. Switch it off. Right. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Could you tell us who you are, please, where you come from, and then ask your question? Okay. I'm Judith Randersly. I'm from Fitzroy Road, and I represent the Croft area residents. Um, this all sounds wonderful, Robert, but the fly in the ointment that I can see is how do developers fit into this? Because at the moment, it seems that if a developer finds a piece of land that he likes, regardless of 
the council's plans and their development strategy, he can basically wade in and do pretty well what he likes. And the council don't seem to be able to do much about it, which seems to me to be a bit of a waste of money. And is that going to carry on? It's a very good question, Jimmy, because you've asked a question about the strategic issue here. Neighbourhood plans aren't going to be there to set these strategic issues. They're not going to be there as vehicles to say no to development. What they are going to be there as is vehicles to make sure that if there is to be development, <coughs> quite sort of in terms of what it looks like, the density, that's a really important issue, I think, for old town residents, bearing in mind some of the developments that we've seen over the last few years, uh, and those sort of issues that really affect quality of life in the neighbourhood. But to come back to your direct question, and I'll, I'll deal with it head on, there is, I think, a strategic problem, an issue uh, in Swindon about the supply of land. That is the big issue that developers are using against us time and time again to try and force through applications on appeal. The council, to be fair to them, developed their plan some years ago. There's an emerging core strategy which has now a far more realistic number of houses to be built than the appalling 37,000 that we were going to be left with by the regional spatial strategy. Remember that wonderful document that's going to impose these targets of us that none of us want, and you know, I and many of you in this room have campaigned against. But we come back again to the five-year land supply issue. Now, those of us in the room who are uh, anoraks when it comes to planning will have read some of the recent planning appeal decisions relevant to Swindon. And despite some good results, I mean, the Hook North result is a great result for residents there, we're coming time and time again against this issue, issue about five-year land supply. Planning inspectors are telling us that Swindon doesn't have a five-year land supply. Well, you know, frankly, from my, and I'm sure your perspective, you know, are they ignoring the recession? We've had a big recession, which means that Wichelstow and other development sites have not come on stream. So as far as I'm concerned, economically, we do have a five-year land supply. Uh, without being too technical about it, what we need to refocus is the way in which that land supply is calculated. And I think it should be calculated against an economic backdrop, rather than one that is based upon theoretical figures about what land has been allocated for housing. Now, if we can nail that... I can't make any promises today, but I'm back to hand it that every opportunity I get, if we can nail that, that will go a long way, I think, to remove the spectre of developers thinking they can get their own way on the people. Thank you. Okay. Next question. Um, hi, it's Kayleen Boyd of Hesketh Crescent. Um, good to see you here today. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your continued support and guidance um, to those of us who've been concerned about the, the Prof School and stating your objections. It's much, much appreciated. Um, I, I think it's important um, to recognise that irrespective of political affiliation, the public usually have common cause on the fundamentals, such as schools where they are needed, and care for the vulnerable and the venerable, and the need for green space to lift and nurture the spirit. And rather than owning the assets, um, the, local kept, the local authority is merely a custodian of these assets on behalf of the public they're imposed to serve. And I think that's some of the stuff that you've been talking about. So in, as an example, um, if we look at green space at the moment, um, and just, you know, I change my question slightly based on what you've been um, saying. Do you believe that either democracy or localism is served by recategorising and pillaging green space for development without either the involvement or knowledge of the public? So I could quote the Croft and um, Pickard's field, you know, put it with the polling <coughs> ground next, we all know about quotes. So my question in this really is, it's great to talk about the neighbourhood plans, but in order to do that, we need to start actually understanding what's going on before anybody can have any input. Everything that's been discussed or decided as an example on green space needs to be the public domain. So if we don't have that frame of reference, yeah. the discussions are not going to work. Yeah. Thanks, Karine. Um, to answer your point directly, you're talking about the need for the community to see the evidence. Yeah. Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, that is built into the process because if, let, let's say, Piper's Residence Association wants to do the neighbourhood for it. The council has a duty to work collaboratively with the neighbourhood forum. The neighbourhood forum in developing its plan is going to say, well, what, what existing evidence is there? What, where do we start from? You know, what, what is the learning on this? Uh, what, are, what are the figures? What, what, what research has been done? What is already designated green space? Why is it that? Do we need more? Do we need less? 
uh, all those questions need to be asked. And therefore, existing evidence that has been gathered by the Planning Authority should be very much part of the mix and made available so that neighbourhood forums can look at it, discuss it, and help build the plans. Because without that evidence, the plans themselves are not going to work. And I'm not thinking about, uh, particularly from, from a local council point of view, I'm thinking about it from a planning inspector's point of view. Because planning inspectors are always looking for the evidential base for any plan. And it's vital that both uh, Swindon-wide and, neighbor, um, and in neighbourhoods, we have plans that are built upon sound evidence. So the answer to your question is yes, absolutely, that evidence has to be provided so that we have sound plans that can stand any attack from appeal. Okay, are we doing okay for time? Have you got more questions from there? Questions? <coughs> One, two. Good morning, Robert. Good morning. Uh, thank you for explaining localism, but uh, to me it was a usual politician's thing. There's a lot of really stuff in there and <coughs> and you never clarified things, so yeah, I've got Jim, a couple of questions. Can you introduce yourself? Oh, <laughs> I thought I'd have been me already because <laughs> James Boyd, Hesketh Crescent, the other half, Katie and Boyd. Uh, so my first question is, you talked about referendums in these forums in 51%, you said, and then you later said, of those who vote. Now, my question is, is that 51% of the electorate in the ward where this forum will be because they vote, or is it 51% of the members of the forum. Uh, can I add to that? Because yeah. it gets very complicated. You've seen all sorts of things. In fact, I can give you examples of things which happen locally. Um, is that 51% of homes? Because that gets very complicated. I know one particular instance we've got very heated because lots of, <coughs> lots of homes have voted twice and most homes have voted not at all. Um, you know, it seems a very... And who gets to form the question? Because obviously we know in most referendums it's the question which actually wins the day as much as... <coughs> Yeah. the actual yeah. uh, understanding of the issue. Yeah. Good questions, um, I accept. Sometimes politicians do go off into windy rhetoric, um, I plead guilty. But so to deal with the specific questions, Mr. Boyd, um, it is 51% of those who vote. Those who vote, as I understand it, will be residents within the defined boundary of the neighborhood forum area. So that at the beginning of the process, defining the boundary is going to be the important thing to do, so there's no overlap for example, or, or there's no lack of clarity. Now, of course, we've got the electoral register, so it should be a fairly easy task to work out within that defined boundary who is entitled to vote on the electorate, because the, everybody in the electoral register will be entitled to vote on <coughs> the uh, referendum. So, then the turnout, you know, let's hope we'd have a high turnout, let's say it's a 40% turnout, it would be an absolute majority of that turnout, rather than an absolute majority of all residents. And otherwise, you know, being... Frank. I mean, I'm an eternal optimist about politics, and I like to think everybody votes, but, you know, life being what it is, I'm afraid some folk don't. And I wouldn't want that minority, that sort of minority, to hold back the will, clear, express will, of the enthusiastic majority who care about the issues in their neighbourhood and want to take part in the vote. Now, the way in which the question is going to be framed, that has to be done with the agreement of the neighbourhood forum. So the idea that somehow a question could be imposed without the forum to be able to I think the question should be a simple one. You know, do you agree with the neighbourhood plan? Do you support the neighbourhood plan as proposed? I mean, Colin's <coughs> looking at me quizzically. Um, I think I, it may have many elements, and it may be very difficult to split one element well, from another element. I, I, and you may be seen to yeah. tacitly support something which you disagree when it's only one small element of a large plan. I, I take it, but I do think that the, the principle is that the question has to be set by the agreement of the forum. I don't think it should be imposed. Um, okay, I think we've probably got time for about two more questions, and I've got one from the floor. Um, actually, we've got three hands, so we'll go with it. The lady at the back first. Okay. Hello, I'm. I'm Rosemary Earl, and uh, I'm not a local resident, but I spent most of my life in Old Town. Um, and I have a question, something which has struck me and is confusing me and is worrying me. Where do you see the role of the locally elected politician in this? 
One of the big things that has come to uh, my attention lately is that there is <coughs> uh, um, a total, almost total separation between certain elected politicians and local groups. And how exactly do you see the role of the local councillors? Because that really concerns me. Thank you. Thanks, Rose. Um, they have to be an important part of the process. Yes, we're talking about the council, uh, but when, when I've been talking about them, I've been thinking not just of the planning officers who have all the material and the information, but also the ward councillors as well. Uh, and they have to be a part of that process. So, for example, uh, you know, when, when there's the initial meetings between the forum and the council, the councillors have to be there, there has to be a clear public open dialogue so that everybody knows where they stand. Then when the consultation process gets, gets going, or the forum perhaps will want to uh, do a door-to-door -door survey or get some literature out there to the public with a list of questions on there so the public can you know, write away and express their views. Well, again, the councillors, I think, have a role in helping to get that message out as well. Frankly, I think people like me have a role. You know, I mean, I mean I've got a big patch to cover and lots of people, but I'd like to think that I'd be able to roll up my sleeves and actually do a bit of door-to-door -door work <coughs> on issues such as this because, because I'm interested. And I think you know, it's a very good way to engage the public. So I think all the elected representatives, Rose, have a very important role to play, and they've heard your question, and I'm sure that they've you know, heard my answer as well and take everything on board. So thanks for asking it. Um, there are two more questions, but can I just quickly interject with mine, because I think it's appropriate to just keep things moving, which is, how do you see the support for the community? Now, I know through my life, luckily, at various times, I've been in between jobs, and I've been able to put more time into community work than I have at others. I know when I'm employed, I get home at 8, 9 o'clock at night, I can answer a few emails, I can take, go to a link on a website which somebody has sent me, I probably won't go looking for it myself, and if you come knocking on my door, I'm not home. Now that is a large proportion of our community, and certainly a large proportion of the community who live in Old Town, many of whom have got two people working and have children they have to organise. How do we involve those people, rather than just the people who are, with respect, important people, retired people, unemployed people, other people who've got time to involve themselves? Well, it's a, it's a challenge for all of us who are in public life to try and reach out to residents either in Swindon or elsewhere who have busy lives, who may be commuting, who are not getting home at times when perhaps I'm coming around knocking the door. Uh, you know, there are a number of, I can think of a number of individual households I've tried to contact over the years and I've never been uh, fortunate in actually speaking to, to the resident. I think the sort of, um, in fact, I think the sort of work I've just mentioned is the door-to-door -door stuff that, that will need to be done. And it's going to need to be done by, by a whole range of people because I think if we just rely on the gifted few, you know, it, you're quite right. It's not going to have the penetration and the, the spread that it needs. So, uh, which is why the, the collaborative stuff that I've been talking about is absolutely vital. You know, this idea that we will just say thanks, neighbour forms, good luck. You know, that's just not going to be how I see it developing. Which is why the council has a legal duty to help advise and support the forums. Uh, and which is why I think the sort of survey, the paper survey exercises, plus making it e as easy as possible online, are going to be ways in which we can reach out to the sort of people you correctly identify. Okay. Oh, I will take these last two questions. Please be as brief as possible. Uh, good morning. My name is Guy Green. I live in St Margaret's Road. Uh, thank you for coming this morning. My question is simple. Um, what happens if there's not an agreement between the local neighbourhood group and the local authority? Who's voice um, hold sway. But that's a very good point. Um, I think the, the, the truth is, if the local neighbourhood plan isn't consistent with national or local planning policy, I think the independent examiner, you know, the person I talked about who looked at it before it went to referendum, would point that out and would say, look guys, you know, I can see your aspirations, but you're going to have to present it in a way that's consistent with the plan, because that's the law, irrespective of whether it's Swindon Borough Council or anywhere else. If you get through that stage and you present a plan that you know, may not be something the local council is entirely comfortable with, it may be different, there may be certain priorities that perhaps wouldn't be theirs, <coughs> frankly, it's the voice of the referendum that matters more than anything, because if it's approved by the referendum, the plan is, has legal force and it has the same legal force as the council's bigger plan. So there's no hierarchy here. 
here. The neighbourhood plan can't be, you know, fobbed off or put into a side drawer, um, treated in a different way. But what you've got to remember is that the neighbourhood plan's role is a different role from that of the strategic plan. It's much more to do with what I call the non-strategic, the, the, the small stuff. But, you know, so often it's the small stuff that people care about, which is why I think, you know, that having equal legal standing is so important when it comes to making that plan. Okay, last question. And there was one more, yes. Sorry. Thank you. I'm at the Hilson, I live in Croft, Derry. Um, within your structure for these forums, um, is there a place for the linking of those forums across the borough? Because one of the problems I see is that we have a lot of community groups, many of whom probably don't talk to each other, and a lot of duplication of work. Um, and I think within the structure there should be something, because at times we need to be much stronger as communities um, in what we're saying, but we could be easily divided by this not happening. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very good question if I do say so, because I think, again, what I should have said in my speech was that I think this structure allows far more of a, a, an ability for local organisations to start networking. At the moment, I think a lot of us in the room will know about different residents associations. You know, I, I can tell you, in my patch, you know, I know Shaw Residents Association, there's Pipers, there's, you know, there's Croft, there, you know, there's so many different associations I know about. But if you actually said to me, well, where the, where the boundaries? Hmm, I'm not so sure. And, and I think this, the, the, the important way we define the boundaries would be a very good way for all these forums to actually go, oh, I didn't know about you, that's very interesting, you're doing this work. And it may well be that one association has gone further down the road than the other and may have people with expertise and knowledge that can then be shared between the associations. I mean, I'll give you an example. It happens with the parish councils already. You know, in, in the rural parts of my constituency, I've got you know, the parish council areas, they will work together and share best practice. And I think spreading that to the non-parish areas, I think, would be a really good byproduct. You could even form an association of <coughs> residents, groups, if you wanted to, to help coordinate that work. So, Robert, do you think that makes sense that perhaps the, the council might be able to facilitate some sort of electronic forum or something where we can find these people? When you're sat in your 20 minutes, you've got a lunchtime, you think, who do I talk to? Because, yeah. let's be honest, when you're busy at work, you don't even get a chance to read the evening appetizer. You need to find out who these people are by looking. Yeah, I, I think there should be a database which would have the names and details of everybody in each forum. And develop, develop into a, an online sharing of information. You know, for example, let's say the Piper Piper's developed an evening forum and, and wanted to publicise some of the work it did, it could publish it online. And then another association, perhaps not further down the line, uh, uh, further back the line, uh, down the line, thinking, gosh, how do I start? Oh, you know, I've looked, I've seen what they've done, oh, that looks pretty good, you know, I can follow that example, take the best from it, and perhaps, you know, vary it according to the local need. What, what I want to emphasise is that it's not, there's no blueprint, it's not as if we want loads of identical organisations, we don't. What we want to see is organisations that genuinely reflect the different nature of each of our neighbourhoods. So, you know, I can think, I mean, you know, representing Southern, I've got so many different neighbourhoods with so many different priorities. Uh, you know, it's fascinating to see how they all work. And I, I think sort of the premise behind your question is going to actually help me and others, you know, understand how the patchwork goes together and, and then we can try and knit it together in, in, in the ways that you suggest. Because I think the problem is the patchwork doesn't always meet and also that the that people's uh, you know Something happening on West Swindon does it yes. on something yes. on the other side and so on. Yes. So we do need to have that. I, I Absolutely. I mean, I, as the MP for South Sweden, I, I, you know, I, I never fail to get amazed by, you know, if I ever lost my seat, I'd have a job as a taxi driver because I know all the nooks and crannies of my map. But if I'm down in line talking to people and I say, oh, yeah, I was over West Sweden, and they're well, so often they'll say, well, I've never been there. I don't know anything about it. You know, it's not my community. And Sweden really is. It, it's got wonderful, vibrant communities, but they don't talk to each other enough. And I think that this will be a mechanism by which we get people talking in a more cohesive way. Fantastic. 
Uh, guys, I'm really sorry. I can see lots of people want to carry on. I know Robert's a very open politician and feel free to get in touch with him directly. I'm saying that because he's told me that before rather than let him say it himself. <laughs> um, I very much appreciate him coming to talk to us. It's really interesting. We probably could have spent the whole two hours talking to the, uh, on this subject, but um, hopefully this will start and we'll be able to pull people together. Um, can we say our appreciation for what you <laughs>